Hello, everyone. Thank you to all of the Black Kids Swim community, our followers and our members for tuning in today. We are so happy and excited to be talking with Alia Atkinson from Jamaica, the famous breaststroker. Good morning, Alia. Good morning, guys. Thank you for having me on. So we know your accolades in the pool. Mm -hmm. um, your famous uh, start in the Olympics at a very young age, um, several times participating in the Olympics, as well as your um, performance in the 50 breast um, and the, being a world record title holder. And we are just so proud of you. Um, but we want to give our members a little bit of an insight into who Alia is. So tell us about yourself. How would you describe Alia in just three words? Alia in three words, I would have to say smiley. Okay. Um, optimistic and loyal. Okay. Yeah. Loyal. Tell us about that one. <laughs> I think because I have to be loyal to say in the sport this long. <laughs> this long. Mm -hmm. um, I've been swimming for 26 years. Um, 20, probably like 19 or 18 of them international competitively. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it's a love and hate relationship. Like with the sport, it is something where you have to be happy to be in it. Um, there are good times and there are bad times, but you have to stay true to yourself and you have to realize what your goals are and how you're going to accomplish that. And sometimes it may take longer than you expected. So you have to be loyal to yourself and to the sport and everybody around you to be honest and say, this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to stick to it no matter what. That's beautiful. That's a very... <laughs> long time to be swimming for such a young woman. How old were you when you started swimming? Um, I learned at four. And then I think with more summer type of, of programs. And mm -hmm. then I started training around eight, eight and nine. And when did you start competing internationally? 11. What? Well, yeah. now, was that with so, Carifta or? Yes, yeah. So Jamaica is a little bit different. We have our Caribbean um, competitions and then the Caribbean and a little bit of Latin America and then the Caribbean and then all of Latin America and then the Caribbean, Latin America and the North Americas. Um, so they, they started out really great in like the branching because um, we don't have competitive swimming like the US. So mm. we, we start a little bit younger. Yeah. That's awesome. I asked um, a swimmer from Trinidad actually if our kids could swim with Carifta, but I guess it's just for um, nationals of the Caribbean. Yeah, unfortunately. But there are different meets uh, throughout the year where um, U.S. and international swimmers can come down and swim in the Caribbean meets. Oh, you're going to yeah. see some Black Kids Swim members there. <laughs> we will talk more about that later. Thank you. No um, worries. So what do you like to do for fun? <sighs> fun. Um, I think for me, fun has changed. And when I was younger, it was more of just hanging out with the family, hanging out with friends. Um, as I got older, it was trying to develop who I am. Because um, I think I lost, not lost, but it, it kind of, the line of who I am became very hazy. It was a swimmer and I didn't know what else. So between the early 20s into mid 20s, just trying to fine tune that line and get a, a straight point into who I am. So that's what fun turned out into me. Um, just trying to see the different things, like what I like, what I don't like. Um, I'm just trying to develop who I am. Um, so I guess fun, no. I don't know, trying to see what the next chapter is, trying to see what I can do in the sport um, with the, the limited time I have left and just to see where I can go. Okay. Um, you have a mission statement that you've mm -hmm. created for yourself in your swim career. Can you mm -hmm. tell us a bit about that? And what so, is your mission? Yeah. <laughs> the mission statement, basically, it's kind of like when they say you want to leave the world better than you, you, you came into it. it is. Um, my, my mission statement is kind of very similar to that. I want to leave the sports of swimming, leave Jamaica swimming and Caribbean swimming better um, than I came into it. Um, and by that, I would have to bring more popularity into the sport, um, bring more representation into the sport. Um, it's not that many people of color, much less females of color. Um, so just keep on bringing that idea 
into the limelight in every single competition because you may see them Olympic year and then suddenly everybody vanishes again. Yeah. So it's to, to see the people ongoing every single day to inspire the kids. Um, and I think that's my mission statement. I do have an Instagram page called Waterbound, which is basically just lighting the path for other people of color that are doing it and just seeing like little snippets and little stories of everybody around there because not a lot of people know that we have swimmers in Uganda and Rwanda and Sierra Leone um, that are trying and are, are doing it no matter the, the limited resources um, that may stop others. Oh, I love that. Um, Black Kids Swim works a lot just to try to interest more kids in the sport, to make mm -hmm. swimming cool, to make swimming fun. So we have a lot of um, PSAs and commercials mm -hmm. and you know photography on the site just to really show how exciting the sport is and to also show them kids who look like them excelling in the sport and enjoying the sport. Um, you mentioned uh, several countries in Africa and I know that Senegal, FINA just opened a center of excellence in Senegal. So I'm hoping to see more um, African swimmers step into the world stage. And um, maybe you can come and visit Senegal and, and do something at the <laughs> Fina Center of Excellence there. I'm sure they would love to have you, um, someone with your accolades. So I definitely would. Um, there is a big, I'm not sure what it is. I don't know if, it, not stereotype. There's a big haze around the idea of, of outside forces coming in and helping, which is great. Don't get uh -huh. me wrong. Okay. But also, pushing up and promoting the people there because there's a really great swimmer, um, Abdul from Senegal. Um, he's gone to Olympics, he's gone all over the world, but just promoting the homegrown idea, I think resonates a lot more in the kids than bringing somebody who, oh, well, of course she can do it. Like, look where she coming from. <laughs> um, so it's really great, but um, just getting those, those grassroots, getting those kids who have grown up in the system and having them excel there and showing the other ones that they can do it too. I think that would be a more powerful message. That is so important. Tell, say his name again, the Senegalese swimmer. Abdul, I cannot pronounce his last name. I'm okay, sorry. it's sorry. okay. We will <laughs> find him. I'll talk with you later on that. Um, and I love that idea, especially for the continent. There's always, especially in the development community, this, this um, looking for the helping hand or the helping hand thinking that there's so much needed. And your mm -hmm. statement about the importance of promoting the homegrown talent is very much um, received. So thank you for saying that. And we'll do that. Um, so if you could train with anybody from any sport for one day, who would it be and why? Oh, um, if I could train with anybody from any sport, for some reason, Serena Williams is coming into my Hey, mind. yes. I feel very intimidated because I don't think I'll be able to keep up. But I think <laughs> I like it in the long run because at the end, I'll be like, wow, I got stronger because of this. <laughs> this one day make so you. mentally tough. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'd have to be like three steps behind you like, come on. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I love that answer. Mm. Okay, Serena. Mm -hmm. All right. And when you go to restaurants, I know when you eat, you're, you're a swimmer. So you have mm -hmm. to be very picky about your nutrition. Mm -hmm. But if just for one day you could eat whatever you wanted, what would it be? You mean like today? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I think it depends on the restaurant. I am mm -hmm. a big Asian fan and Indian and those okay. types of mixtures and curries and um, flavors. I don't know. I guess I would just like to do like a whole four course meal. Like you have the appetizer then you have the salad then you have the main meal or the soup and then the dessert. Like, cause rarely you sit down and you look at the meal and you're like, I cannot afford the appetizer. <laughs> <laughs> so to have that, that would be cool. Okay. Be like, oh, what's next? And just, yeah. So when you are at swim practice, I think you, you've already had your morning practice from for today, yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you have another practice later on today? No, I had swim and gym earlier today. Okay, swim and oh. gym. Okay. <laughs> um, when you're at practice or when you're in the gym, <laughs> what's your personality like? Are you just more quiet, let's get this done? Or are you the motivator with your teammates? How would you describe yourself? 
I think I'm very similar to now. I don't really show the other personas until maybe I need it or mm. I see them struggling and they may need it. Um, or if I'm pushed over the edge, maybe like the hard coach comes in. Mm -hmm. um, but usually, no, it's more of just, all right, guys, let's get through this. Um, <laughs> like, we have to pick it up. Like, let's keep on going. And I think my majority of it is also me just trying to motivate myself as well um, and just staying on the path and trying to be optimistic throughout it. No. You've mentioned that earlier about being loyal to the sport because you have the ups and downs. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's a lot with a, uh, you know, the documentary, The Black Line, um, yeah. you know, putting in those laps, putting in the time in the gym. What advice do you have for swimmers who are starting to experience burnout? Hmm. <sighs> so burnout, you really love the sport. You really gave it your all. You put all the pressure in it, like parental, physical, mental, everything was in it. And after a certain point, it you burn out because you can't give it anymore. Um, what I would say for those kids is to find out the reasons why you started in the first place. And it's not just swimming, it's for anything. Um, find out why you like to swim, for example, and go back to that. Whether it's, I'm not going to go to any more competitions for maybe three months. Mm -hmm. um, or four months or five months, however long it takes, and find that little thing, that little niche that you loved in the first place. And that's how you're going to slowly get back into the sport. Because um, burnout is really only for a certain period of time. Um, they, people say like, oh, she plateaued when she was younger. No, um, you just need to get back into maybe a different type of training, a different regiment, um, get your mind in a different weight or your body in a different way, especially for girls around maybe 14 to 18. We experience a lot during that time. Um, so just finding what you love about the sport and you'll you'll achieve success if you continue through it, but you have to continue through it. One of our favorite coaches, Coach Corey Wallace, um, he helped us put together our swim clinic. Uh, Black Kids Swim created an Afro-cultural swim clinic called Tobono. Mm -hmm. And we have um, Black coaches, a uh, Black personal trainer, nutritionist, and they just really, it's all about the kids who are kind of tired of being the only one and maybe experiencing burnout and maybe yeah. not getting the support from their team and their coach. Um, and they love it. And it's a great time. And we not only address the kids, but the parents have a curriculum as well that they have to follow to be more supportive uh, and more educated swim parents. Mm -hmm. So Coach Corey always says that happy swimmers are faster swimmers. So what would you say to that? That is absolutely correct. <laughs> I would say happy swimmers are definitely faster swimmers um, because no matter what happens, they will still keep on going. Where you have um, an athlete where maybe they put too much stress on themselves or they start to be more pessimistic about their races, mm -hmm. they're less inclined to give it their all the next time. Whereas a happy person is is just grateful and be like, all right, let's see what we can do the next time. <laughs> like that was really bad. Let's see what we can do the next time. <laughs> um, and just having that optimistic feel about it, it just, it, it gives you the energy because being sad and depressed and frustrated is really, it, it's heavy. Um, and if you hold on to that a lot, you'll see it in the swimming. Um, so a happy swimmer is definitely a faster swimmer. Um, they're also a better athlete because they'll be able to bounce back. And eventually in life, when all this happens again, outside of the sport, right. they'll be a better person for it. Thank you, Alia. Mm -hmm. Did you, you're like a little, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a little daughter <laughs> mama or something. <laughs> um, so did you always know that you wanted to be a famous elite swimmer? No. Um, when I was maybe about 11, when I first made my Karifta team, mm -hmm. um, my main goal was to beat the boys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to be the fastest fresh choker. And currently, I am the fastest fresh choker. Yay! Out there. Um, <laughs> But I think growing up, it was more of the fun aspect. I liked it because I get to compete with the boys. Um, and I was at that age where girls and boys were very similar before right. they started shooting up. <laughs> um, so for me, that was fun. Um, that's what I enjoyed. And then as I got older, I started racing more girls who were around my level. 
so it switched into being just the fastest I can be. Mm -hmm. um, and my family always made sure that we had swimming and school together. So academics and school and swimming. And that continued all the way up to college. So it wasn't until I graduated college where I had the chance to, what do I want to do? I had the chance to decide. And that's when I decided to go pro. And it wasn't probably maybe 2014 where I'm actually like, oh, maybe I am like famous. Or <laughs> somebody may know me. Um, but yeah, it took all that time up until 2014 for people to see me outside of just a black girl in a race. Right. Now they said, oh, it's the Jamaican girl. And then a couple more years, oh, it's Alia. <laughs> Yay, finally. <laughs> but it took a while. It did. Um, so yeah, I can't really answer that because I don't know what an elite athlete looks like, um, or you much less what the world looks exactly like. Exactly you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> so today, today. <laughs> oh yeah. Um. So because people do know you now, you're not just the black girl in the race. You're Alia Atkinson from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. um, what is the question that you get asked the most that you are so tired of answering? Are you friends with Usain Bolt? Oh. <laughs> are you friends with Usain Bolt? <laughs> See, are you asking that? Or I am. You... I want to know. <laughs> so it's funny. So people ask me like, hey, are you friends with, like, do you know Usain Bolt? I'm like, yeah. Are you guys friends? Like, yeah. Do you have his number? I'm like, okay, we're not that close. Like, <laughs> we're not that type of friend. Like, <laughs> I would consider him a friend, but <laughs> oh my! Every single time now, like, oh, that makes sense. I hadn't even thought to ask that question. So thank you for telling. You're welcome. <laughs> but yeah, and I think that um, when you were talking earlier about the whole uh, promotion of homegrown talent, I mm -hmm. have read that Usain is very big on if people want to do a commercial or do any work with him, they have to do it in Jamaica and hire Jamaican staff and talent yeah. and i just think that's wonderful that he does that um takes that extra thought for his yeah. fellow jamaicans yeah it's something that we don't really think about until somebody does it you're like yeah that, that's true like it should be done in jamaica and getting the the popularity and the the work yeah the yeah so tell us what does it take? Um, you, you talked about when you were 11 and you wanted to beat the boys. And I think that I, I see kids like between the age of seven and 11, especially kids in our community, they're doing great and they're beating everyone. And then they get to like 12, 13, 14, and they're not dropping time in every race. They're not breaking records in every race. And so they think, well, maybe I'm not as good as I thought. Maybe I should go try something else. And we start mm -hmm. to lose really talented swimmers to other activities. Um, can you give some advice to, to the kids and the parents who are in that kind of funny stage and, and really speak to what it takes to go from that phase to really being an elite swimmer? So that's where the loyalty comes in for sure. Mm. Um, because maybe under 12 or anybody really who is maybe two years into the sport, like very fresh into the sport. It's easy to pick up uh, the different techniques. It's easy to get your body to where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And that's where you drop all the time. And that's where the fun comes in. And then you reach like this part where I have optimized and I've done everything physically possible for my body. Now, if you stay on this projected path, you're probably going to start getting worse and worse because you're not going to have best times. Everybody else is going to get faster. And you may think that you're not as great as you thought you were. Mm -hmm. um, but that's really where you need to start building and building and building. Now, if it takes you two years to reach here, building on a year is probably not going to see that much of an effect. Um, it, it's it's going to take a while, especially for girls. I know between preteens, boys around 13, 14, 15, they start to get more height. Um, they got to get more mu more muscle mass and they start to build and develop into a more bigger figure. Mm -hmm. um, it's easier for them to be able to go faster and to see that potential and have more muscle growth and have more strength and speed. For girls, we our bodies start to mature. Puberty starts to set in. Our bodies start to change. Um, the feeling in the water starts to change. We don't feel the same way anymore. Emotions start to come in. And <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
smorgasbord of things. And during that time, swimming isn't on your mind, uh, much less going into the pool and being, I don't want to do this and actually having to force yourself to do it. Um, and then you do it for maybe a year and then you didn't drop any time. Like it just felt like you wasted a whole year. Um, I would have to say for athletes at that time, go back to what you love about the sport. If you love going in and just having best times and just giving it your all, um, then give it your all, but do it because you love it, not because you're expecting to drop all this time and get first and get the national level and then Olympics by the youngest 18. Like mm -hmm. that's not as realistic as we, as we can hope for. Um, we can only hope for the things that we can control and that's having a good practice, being optimistic and trying your best. That is it. Um, I've had, I think when I was 16, I went 110 in the 100 breaststroke mm -hmm. and I did not break that until I was 22. Whoa! My entire collegiate career, I didn't break that time. And it really, it was kind of like, did I choose the right program? Like, obviously this is the program. Mm -hmm. Like, this is not me. Um, but what we did, we switched into different events. So instead of breaststroke, we did more IMs, more flies, more mid free and distance free. And all those times started dropping. So even if it wasn't my best event, I still got that little, that, that prideful feeling like, oh, yay, <laughs> I'm at least succeeding in the freestyles or the flies. Mm -hmm. um, and that helped me. That helped me continue through that phase. Um, so parents, for sure, just stick with it and make sure you talk to the child because not all the time do they actually want to continue in the sport. And if it is one of those things, then you need to have an honest conversation with them and say, what do you want to do? Like, are your goals from two years ago still your goals today? And if they say no, then it's a whole different conversation. Mm -hmm. But if they say yes, then you have to sit down and say, okay, this is what we're going to do to reach there. We need to talk to the coach. We need to think about a plan that you can have fun in the pool. Um, if you don't want to compete for a little while, then let's think of something else. Um, but changing it up and, and doing more of your weaknesses in your practices than your, your best one. Um, and having fun. Like... Without fun, going up and down the pool is, is just going up and down the pool. Um, mm -hmm. But being there with your friends, having some splash time, some dives, some joke races, um, relay races, and having fun with it, that's that's what the child remembers later on, not the bad time. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of um, Howard University. So I, Coach Nick Askew is amazing, and he mm -hmm. let us come and view a practice once. Mm -hmm. And they turn out all the lights, so like just the pool is lit, and they're blasting music, and it's like almost like a party. And um, I can see why <laughs> they they just love being on that team. All of the the teammates are really good friends, and um, I think he really understands that whole you know happy swimmers are faster swimmers. Yeah. So. Black Kids Swim obviously was founded to increase the number of Black competitive swimmers because mm -hmm. swimming is not diverse. And um, we want our kids not only to learn how to swim to, to remedy the drowning situation, mm -hmm. but more importantly, we want them to excel in the water and we want them to benefit from everything being um, talented in aquatics can afford you, you know, career-wise, whether that's competitive swimming or coaching, yeah. being an athletic director, whatever it may be, we want our kids to have access to all of that. Yeah. So when we say that swimming is not a diverse sport, what is your opinion on that? I agree. It's really hard not to agree, especially with the media and what you portray in the sports. Um, what you televise, maybe it's only finals and not many people of color make it to the finals to actually mm. see that, hey, we do have other people in the race as well. Um, but I've always been an advocate for having a color-filled pool, um, having more people from all over be able to represent their country, um, even if it's uh, a universality or it's an invite, but just to represent their country. Um, but it takes a lot. It takes knowledge. It takes awareness, uh, but not just from the coach or that athlete. It takes everybody else around. So if you have a swimmer and she's the only person of color on your team, you have to treat her differently than everybody else in the sense of, hey, how are you doing today? Like trying to involve her in all the other events, trying to, to promote her and saying, 
you're not just swimming for yourself because you're not. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of us get lost in the whole trend of, of a certain type of looking pool. And I think we forget that we should be striving to reach there. And everybody who reaches there, that's opening up another door for somebody else below us to reach. Um, without Maritza, Maritza Karaya, we maybe wouldn't have had Simone Manuel or Leah Neal or Natalie Hines or Ariana Vanderpool Wallace, like all these international swimmers and US swimmers coming up in the ranks and getting NCAA championships, getting Olympic medals. Um, so I think each person has their own place, their own part to play. Um, but it's also educating the community, the team, the swimmers, and knowing that the little black girl on the team has a role to play. Mm -hmm. um, she's not just swimming for herself. She's swimming for all the other people looking at her and wishing her well, or maybe not wishing her well. Um, it's the world we live in right now. Um, but it's, it's that little girl could change the face of swimming. Um, and if we look at it from a, from a, a, a a big push, like a, a project type of thing, we'll have more people coming into the sport for the sake of changing the sport, um, which is, it's a different directive. Um, but I think first we just need to get more people in the water, having yeah. more citizens, having more people just come out and just learn how to swim regardless. Um, and that alone will just open up the pool of more swimmers and the probability of having more uh, elite swimmers as well. Nice. So it, as you said about changing the sport, um, you are part of the new International Swim League, mm -hmm. which is working to to make swimming more exciting, make it more of a, an entertainment sport, more of a spectator sport. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us about the league and why you chose to join. So the International Swimming League started a couple of years back, but I think this is the first time. It's kind of like the pilot competitive series. It's four different meets um it's eight or six please do not quote me i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> it is a number of teams all over the world mm -hmm. um that will be competing against each other um and we'll have them competing with each other trying to make enough times and then the top two teams goes to las vegas for like a duo um meet nice. to see who's the top team yeah um and it opens it up for television rights it opens up for marketing and branding because in the sport fina um, puts swimming under the amateur level so we can't have branding we can't have television rights like an athlete themselves can only have like i have speedo um only have associated swimming brands to their name mm -hmm. besides that nobody else can have it so like nascar or formula one or all the other sports yeah we, have, we are not allowed to have that um, so it limits the amount of finances that an athlete can get, as, as a swimmer can get. Um, so what ISL is doing is having that weakness and opening it up um, and, and trying to see what we can do for athletes as they get older, as they start to finish their career and they have no financial opportunities left. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad that there's, there are more professional opportunities for swimmers out there. Yeah. and more of a chance for you all to share in the money that is made off of the swimming industry. Because yeah. in a sport where you're buying like $600 swimsuits has yeah. enough money <laughs> to go around. Uh, but that's a discussion for another day, the whole time. <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you, Alia, for your time today Hi. and for, for sharing your wisdom and your experiences with the Black Kids Swim community. Are there any last thoughts that you want to share with our parents and swimmers? So I had a really great interview with Coach Ellis. Um, oh, okay, Jim Ellis, yeah. Yeah, and his interview will be on the Waterbound YouTube page in the coming days. Mm -hmm. um, but something that really resonated with me was I asked him, what is it like for you as a coach to see a Caucasian swimmer versus a black swimmer, and how would you coach them differently? Mm. And just the way he answered was like straight on the money. Like it's not just about physically getting them ready. It's about mentally getting them ready for all the things that could happen. Their, their physical growth, um, just the prejudice in the sport may or may not, he may, he may or may not see it. Um, but when you get to a certain level, it is present. Um, and just the physiolog physiological things that comes with it is completely different from another swimmer of another race or color or anything like that. Um, so it was a really great read. Um, 
and it will be on the page soon. So we will have to watch that. So that's Waterbound, W A T A B O U N D. It is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so check out her page, check out her videos, especially this upcoming interview with Coach Jim Ellis, legendary coach from Philadelphia. Um, mm -hmm. We definitely want to support every single thing that Miss Alia Atkinson does. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. No worries. Thank you, guys. Have a good day.